great South American poet, Pablo Neruda, has written, Pardon me if what I want to tell you about my life is the land I talk about. This is the land. It lives in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. So you're going to wait, 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 wait a minute here. There's a guy that's supposed to be talking about art and science, science and laying this heavy stuff about how we should be paying attention to the land on us. <laughs> Let me reintroduce myself with uh, an introduction after a couple of definitions. First, I think that science is a device that we've invented to extend our perception. And art is a device that we've used to extend our expression. Now, with Neruda's permission, I will reintroduce what I intend to say to you today. Pardon me if when I intend to give a talk about data visualization, science, and art, it's the land I talk about. The land is pivotal in any way we look at the world. And when I use the word land, I'm talking about the environment in general. And we, its power over us, is, is, it finds interesting form in our culture. If you look at the primary view that has been engineered in this brand new library, and look out to the north here, along the expansive windows it affords, it looks at the signature geologic feature of this beautiful river valley. The rims, as we call them here locally, which are uh, uh, the remnant of the uh, uh, huge uh, sandstone overlay that, that used to cover this entire area. What I'd like to do is look at some of the other uh, information systems that different peoples have looked at quickly. Kind of like, um, if you remember the last time that you were at a lake and skipped stones on the water, and those, the stone will arc, and then arc shorter and shorter, and then plane into uh, the water before it sinks. That's the kind of tour I, I intend to, uh, to take. I want to look at a few different peoples and how they looked at the land and incorporate it into their way of life. I think it's important before we begin talking about science and art, data visualization, and all of these fancy 21st century terms that are um, emerging as we explore <coughs> computation and its abilities, and see how other people have uh, invested their knowledge systems with a notion of where they are. Because where they are and how they define that greatly defines them. It's no different for them than us. I'm going to throw the stone, and the first place we're going to start with the stone is in Australia. The indigenous people there, the aboriginal people, had a, a technique that's called kajika, it means song line. In the 1980s, mid-1980s, uh, Bruce Chapman published a book that introduced us to the concept. And basically, it's a melodic recitation of the history and the topography of the landscape, all in one thing. It's it it's, was created in a pre-scientific era, but it has an analysis to it that almost is, it shakes us fundamentally in terms of how we perceive our science relative to it. What they would do was they would make the, the melody of the song, the kajika, follow the topography of the land. So if they were descending a steep slope, they would have an arpeggio as, as the melody uh, went downhill. What the melody or what the lyrics of the song would be um, reciting would be the history of the people who were there, the, the creation myth that caused the landscape to look like it is, and the relationships of the people one to another. The interesting thing about it, too, it was a way to uh, uh, encourage social connection because clans would know the Kajika, the song line, on either side of them, of, of, of their clans, and this information was passed on generationally. It gave them a, a familiarity with the people next to them and through them the landscape as well. Now the stone has skipped out into the sea north of Australia, and you're in the land of, the, of, of all the islands uh, in terms of, uh, of its, uh, the configuration of the globe at that time. And you, you have this massive world of the uh, uh, Solomons and all of the islands north of uh, New Zealand and in, in that vast ocean water world. It's the inverse of Australia, which is a landmass pocketed with scattered pockets of water. This is a massive water world scattered with islands. And the, the people in that landscape incorporate a knowledge of the water patterns, because the way water either reflects or reflect, refracts off of the islands is an indication to them of the direction of the winds, the direction of uh, incident traffic on the water, and there's a whole 
a whole myriad form of understanding the water that is in, uh, that implies a deep attunement to the landscape and how it functions. These stick, stick charts, which you've probably seen, are fami a familiar way to, uh, uh, to embed those uh, patterns in memory. Each person made these th themselves, and they're made of palm fronds lashed together with uh, seashells. Detritus from the island world, basically, to indicate places where islands were. Another interesting convention that they use is they would build stone structures on the ground, which warms my sculptor's heart. But they, they, when standing outside of the stone structure, there'd be a center part, and then all of these patterns of stones around it. If you stood outside, it was a, the center part represented an island, and the way the uh, rocks were positioned around the outside indicated the way the waves hit that island. If you sat on the stone inside the stone structure, it was then a boat. And this, the way the, the rocks around it uh, uh, outlined your position indicated positions of stars and the right of <coughs> the stars on the horizon. Okay, the rocks left this spot, and we're going to go up along the coast, coast in Antarctica. A whole different kind of uh, map, mapping a, a familiarity with the landscape, is, is exhibited in a small artifact of cedar wood that was found there. A little rectangular block. And down the side of the block, it's very clear that it represents the inlets and, and uh, uh, peninsulas on the coastline. And then the artist runs out of space, so he simply flips the block over and continues carving the coastline down the side. A map he can keep in his pocket and tell where he is in his kayak by feeling it. Now, that, now we're coming closer to the end of this, and this, plane, this uh, rock is going to plane into a stop against the shore. We're going to start off the coast of... France, and a part of uh, history that is very exciting, exhilarating, kind of like our time right now where we're having all of these new technologies that are versioning uh, and, and uh, supplying information to us in terms of how the world is, what the world is. We learned to fly after a long trial. This is a Berlioz 11 plane. You can tell by the title, it took a while. I'd like to discuss four parts of this airplane that are implemented together that indicate, oh, this is convenient. One of them is the bicycle wheel. <laughs> and you can see, if you put a seat on it, you have a means of transportation. seat, you have one of the iconic works of the 20th century. This is Duchamp's Bicycle Wheel on a Stool in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it is, it is unique in that this, hap, uh, this was created in about 1930. The flight over the English Channel in the Berlioz 11 occurred in 1909. So the world is on fire with ideas. We have this amazing ability to fly at the same time we have this being called art, which was totally innovative concept. The word ready-made that Duchamp used to define this kind of art, he picked up from a dress shop on the streets of New York where you could walk in uh, to the dress shop and walk out with a ready-made garment as opposed to having it um, designed for you. The next object that I'd like to talk about with the, with the airplane is the, the propeller. Duchamp and his friend, uh, Constantin Brancusi, and another artist named Fernand uh, Legere, we're at a show that was showing the aviation uh, marvels of the, of the day. And Duchamp ran into the propeller. As you can see, they're beautiful, beautifully made thing, hand carved out of wood. And he says to Brancusi, he says, painting's washed up. And by that, he means the uh, representational painting of the time that he called retinal. Painting's washed up. This is the future. Can you create this? And this is Brancusi's answer. You've probably seen this sculpture. It's very famous. It's called Bird in Space. And it, it alludes to the flight of a bird in space. So these artists were right in touch with the, the contemporary technology that was happening at the, at the moment. And, and Brancusi, by making an object like this, is way out on a limb. So far, in fact, that when they tried to ship this into New York as an art object, tax-free, 
the, the customs people wouldn't let him because they, in fact, claimed it was a propeller. <laughs> I apologize. There we go. The next thing I want to talk about is the, the way that all of this airplane was controlled. And this, so we have the, the bicycle wheel and we have the propeller. And the propeller was attached to the airplane itself with these bolts. And from the bolts to the engine, directly to the crankshaft, you go to the controls. And these are the mechanical controls that existed on the airplane. You have pitch, or roll, excuse me, and you have pitch and you have yaw that has to be controlled. And it was all controlled mechanically, as you see illustrated here. Berlioz invented this bell shape so that it could be stabilized and held with his knees or feet while he was actuating other elements of the plane to make it function. Through the course of this, you, ha you have to realize that Berlioz, not only did he have to invent the machine through which to fly in this very slippery medium called air, he then had to teach himself to fly it while flying. So a lot of people died. <laughs> it was a difficult, a difficult attempt at achieving something that was something that gave us, at this point in history, a whole new view of the landscape. And I just learned yesterday that the room we're sitting in does the same thing for us. This carpet was especially woven for the library and, and made to be reminiscent of the patchwork landscape that agriculture creates with um, the, the Rocky, region, Rocky Mountain region of the country. Now, the technology was changing really, really quickly. The unicyclist that rode in here just now reminded me of uh, a fellow by the name of Claude Shannon, who was pivotal in terms of the world of information as we know it. He worked for Bell Labs. And, and what he did was come up with a mathematical theory of communication. And in the process, enabled the possibility to deal with what we call it bits nowadays, binary information that could be dealt with with logic circuits and be used to control the things that Valerio had to do with his uh, mechanical devices electronically. So these, eventually, these, these vacuum tubes that could be used as switches, yes or no, on or off, to, to do computational, uh, com computationally complex things eventually led to semiconductors, uh, materials, and transistors uh, from the point uh, on to the, to the present. We'll look at, uh, this is a piece by uh, Laszlo Maholinaj, and it's a light space modulator. This happened during the mid uh, 20th century, the same time, where he uh, built this piece of sculpture to modulate the space it was in generally in performance spaces, with light. This piece gyrates around and moves, and creating shadows and reflections throughout the room. Now, the last thing I want to talk about with this uh, airplane is not the airplane that's in the image. But the concept of the image itself. That has changed dramatically, too, in the time since um, this airplane was invented. What's inside this frame has, was originally a mixture of chemicals on a surface, the richest surface probably that humans have ever invented. And now it's a surface that's comprised of numbers. Each pixel that you see on a computer screen, if you're dealing with a red, green, and blue color space, deals with a little stack of numbers, each 256 values. Um, each encompassing 256 values. And those values can generate over 16 million colors. Because computers can crunch simple kinds of things so quickly, uh, they have enabled us to do whole kinds of, uh, whole, wholly different kinds of work. And the language that combines all of this is the digital language. Programming languages allow us to deal with these massive amounts of information. <coughs> So where does a young grad student who's come out of college start? This, I graduated from the University of Montana in 1974 with a fresh MFA in my pocket. I want to contribute to the conversation. And so how do you do that? Science is easy. It has a method. You can go in and you can have a hypothesis and you can generate experiments to disprove or prove a hypothesis. 
And then you can um, uh, proceed that way. Art's not like that. It's like math. You have to have an idea, and then you have to keep having ideas to somehow figure out how you're going to do what you do. And, and, and then science also has uh, instrumentation. You can you build instruments to measure things, and it dawned on me. I would introduce instruments as sculpture with which to investigate the landscape. This is one of the first ones. This is a 35-year-old instrument, part of a suite of four instruments that took a measure of the landscape. It's a wind drawing instrument, moves, moved by the wind, that describes its pattern on a sheet on, on the uh, drawing surface. This is a good translator. It translates the flow of water in the creek into sound. The floats read the uh, up and down the motion of the water, and then windmills drive these spectrums and make them move. All of the technology that I've covered has been, been reduced in size because of Claude Shannon and his, and his peers. This is nowadays a computer, a full-blown computer invented in Europe. You can help young kids learn how to program. This is a camera that can shoot video or still information. And this is that propeller. Of course, you've seen them on wind turbines, too. It's scaled both ways. I've taken all of this information. I'm interested in the landscape, mystified by it. Albert Einstein says that uh, it's one of the most sublime experiences people have is, is mystery. It attends the nature of true art and true science. This is the last piece that I'll show you. It's a piece under development. This is a piece for the future. It's designed to walk into space, into a, land, a landscape space, and investigate it at a human pace. It can fly. Is combining contemporary technology of the quadrotor with the bicycle wheel so that it can walk out into a landscape and persist there. It has solar cells so that it can supply its own energy and it can, it can move across a landscape either governed by radio frequency control or through its own programming. But it's intended to last and survive out there on its own and investigate the landscape that I think informs us and it really defines who we are as a people. It has one advantage over Duchamp's bicycle wheel on a stool in that the legs can pivot and provide its own tripod. <laughs> Thank you very much. One, one other thing before I just about forgot. One other thing, teach your children to code. This, this digital information that we have out there is a new medium. It's a lens through which we can see nature. If you teach your children to code, they'll figure out how to focus and then, and finally, land will be in them and they will live.